so everybody can see the presentation, right? Okay, perfect. I'm going to start with a story. Um, I am Mexican. I come from Mexico City and I come from a neighborhood that isn't very rich in, in some sort of way. It's uh it's near one of the one of a very dangerous neighborhood in Mexico and maybe I could say that my life wouldn't be uh, as special as I thought it would be. But there was a nice opportunity and my family got the opportunity to leave Mexico for some months and to live elsewhere. Uh, I went with them and there was this moment when uh, everything changed in my life. And honestly, at that moment, I didn't know that it would change. For me, it was just some random day and some weird moment in my life. And that moment is here. Uh, I visited I visited Louvre, and that's my mom. And for some reason, that moment just stuck in my brain like for a long, long, long time. And you can you can see in the photo that my face is like. I don't know what's happening, but I like it. And I'm horrified by it too. Uh, I wouldn't know how much this little um, experience would affect me the rest of my life, but it did. And uh, thanks to this visit to a very popular museum, I started to open my mind more and more and more. And I started to be very interested in a lot of things like really very interested in a lot of things. My dad has, uh, my dad is very fanatic of music. So I started to develop an interest in music. My uncle was a painter. So I started to develop interest in art. And honestly, I wanted to do everything except to be in school. I hated to be in school because, and I realized that it wasn't because I don't, because I don't like to learn. It was because of the way they taught me things. And so I was just wanted to be like this rebel who wanted to do everything, but nothing at the same time. I wanted to be a film director and I wanted to be a game developer and I wanted to be an artist and a musician and an actor and everything. But when you want to do everything, it's kind of impossible. Or, or that's what I thought. Um, what is my first encounter with digital reality? Because this is not about me, this is about digital art. Uh, my first encounter with digital reality was with video games. Me being interested in a lot of things, uh, my parents told me like, hey, you know what? Maybe you should, maybe you should just stay home and just uh, chill out with video games. And like, yeah, sure. And I started to play this game, which is Crash Bandicoot. And at that moment, it was super strange because there was this 3D environment. And there, there were things that I couldn't understand, but they had like a form. They had a volume. And for me, that was like, wow, now that's something else. Like in the left, you can see there's a half dog, half crocodile holding like a nuclear weapon. And then there's this like animal in the middle dancing. And on the right, there's like a crazy chihuahua. And for me, that, that, I didn't care. Uh, I didn't think about the graphics or anything, but it was just so cool. And I remember this is a racing game. And I remember that instead of racing, what I did was just drive the opposite way. And I just wanted to see the world because it was like, wow. There's like a world inside this PlayStation and I wanted to see everything and I want, and I was small. So my mom thought like, well, if that's a world, a world, maybe the people live there. And maybe every time I turn on the PlayStation, 
they they live. Maybe I can find them. And uh, little by little, I realized that it wasn't the case. Uh, there's not a lot of people living in the world uh, at all. So, but that opened like uh, a big alley for me in, in my mind. And this is where we start to talk about digital art, uh, the new reality. Why is it uh, the new reality? Uh, well, I'll introduce myself. My name is Ethan Avila. I am an artist. Uh, I am also teaching uh, here in Itmom. I teach you 3D modeling uh, and how to use Blender, how to use Unity, and uh, hopefully you how to make some interesting interactive things like video games. Um, I do 3D renders, I do music, I do video games and short films because I love to do a lot of stuff. It doesn't mean they're good, but yeah. Uh, so uh, what is reality? So hard question. And but at the same time, so easy to think about what's real and what's not real. Um, the old alchemists had this idea of uh, the external and the internal reality, which is why uh, in analytical psychology, we have this idea of introvert and extrovert, uh, the world inside and the world outside. So we have this like beautiful triangle and the moon represents the physical reality, which is like close to us. Everything that you see right now, everything that you can touch, everything that you can see. The personal reality is everything that you, you have inside uh, your mind, your dreams, your thoughts. And I'd like to think that they are in a different realm of reality because you can perceive them even though they don't exist. So if I tell you about, think about a pink elephant floating in the clouds, you can do it. And you can imagine it, but it's not physically real, but it's still real inside of your, your mind or dreams. When you dream, you can have a nightmare and uh, it could feel like physically real, but you could, it could make you cry. It can make you scream. It can make you feel bad. But when you wake up, everything was just intangible. And that's where you start to see like the difference. It doesn't mean that it's not real. It just, it's a different type of real. And then the sun, he, it's on the left, he uh, represents universal reality. And universal reality is things that we cannot see. Patterns, mathematics, physics, gravity, magnetism, etc. Now, here in the middle, this uh, convenient star uh, is what I like to call the digital reality. Why would I like to call it the digital reality? Because it forms between the three. You can create stuff that only that you can only think about in your mind, and you can make uh, you can create physical stuff inside this reality. But it also is kind of an abstraction of universal reality in, in some sense. Uh, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, and it's very important uh, for you to, to know that us as humans, I think everybody here is human, hopefully, or hopefully not, and we have some weird being here. But humans do not see objects, uh, they see narratives or tools in that matter, how to use them, where to use them, and if they can or cannot use them. So. Each time you see a thing, our brain is wired to, to see them as a narrative, not as an object. And yeah, you can see something and say like, no, no, no. If I see a, a pencil, it's a pencil. It's an object, it's a pencil. But that's your conscious thinking. When, you're, when you see a pencil, your unconscious thinks about how to grab it and it activates the muscles of your head. And uh, there's a lot of things about the unconscious we don't understand. And this is... a uh, kind of uh, an invitation to to go deeper and to understand more about how we perceive. And the digital world follows our symbolic rules. 
which means that uh, even though it's our own creation and we can do whatever we want to it as we want, it still has to follow like basic human rules. And these basic human rules are evolutionary. We have uh, we are more afraid in the dark than we are afraid of in the light. Why? Because our eyes are not evolved to see in darkness. So whenever we create something in a digital world, it must follow kind of the, the symbolic rules of the normal reality. A stop sign means the same. A peace sign means the same. And we have this sort of dictionary of symbols that it is universal and we can adapt it to the digital and we, we use it in the physical. And one thing very, very, very magical is that we can manipulate the physical reality. And this for me is just like something that made me fall in love with, uh, with the digital space because as I told you, I wanted to do everything. And uh, in university, I really didn't know what I wanted to do because I had to choose something. And I went into university and they showed me that they had this new thing called animation and digital art. I was like, huh, what is this animation and digital art? Uh, I went in and they told me, well, animation is this thing in which you make untangible things move and have life. And now it's very popular in 3D where you can move lights and move everything and everything is cool. And I'm like, huh. And you can put music and you can draw. And it's also like film. So for me in that moment, I saw animation as the perfect thing. It was like, wow. Animation just like combines everything that I like. Of course, I'm going to study it. And for the first time in my life, I started to do good in school. I started to not almost fail everything. And uh, I think I was quite fast in getting to know things because it was something that I liked. And uh, for me, it was fascinating that I could just create a floating elephant with clouds and make it into a video game or create some weird creature that nobody else has ever seen. And in programs, they have gravity. You can take out the gravity. You can make him float. You can make you can make it be green. You can make it be yellow. You can make it be whatever you want. And in that sense, it was super fascinating for me because in our lives, we don't have control. We don't have control over our lives. But at least in this digital reality, we have a bit of control or we like to think that we have control. So maybe it's just a way to reaffirm control over our lives. In the sense, um, when I told you about abstraction, symbolic abstraction, eh, I refer to these uh, theories that maybe, just maybe, uh, our reality has a basic structure on the top. It could be geometrical, like uh, the golden ratio, with, which is in all nature. Or some people say that we live in a simulation. We can't really know. Uh, so we can see geometry everywhere. And well, geometry, math, is everything math related? Is not? Is everything physical? Is everything not? And when you start to see video games, then you start to see that these words, the worlds, these 3D worlds are created Oh, with geometry and little by little, the more complex they become, the more geometry they have, the more simulations they have, the more particles. And it starts to become a more true adaptation of real life. Little by little, little these video games strive to be real. Some video games like to be cartoony and funny and everything, but a lot of video games just strive for realism. The, the more real your video, your video game is, the better. And that's interesting, but we don't have time to talk about that, even though it's very interesting. Going back to how we see narratives, one clear example is that when we think about meaning, 
we when we when we talk about facts, we, we must understand that we don't see facts. Facts are just <laughs> something that we use to create narratives. So in this moment, every one of you, if you're paying attention, you're looking at this PowerPoint or at uh, my screen or an other window of your computer or phone. But you are not looking at something that exists. You're looking at tiny little lights that turn on and turn off. But you're in, in your mind, you block that. You're not, you, you're, you're not thinking, huh, these lights are turning on and off. Hmm, I like it. Oh, I can see the little points there. Because your brain, your brain blocks this part of your mind, which is which you're not interested in, and just grabs the bigger picture because that's what's useful for you. That's what gives you meaning. And the meaning is what I'm telling you right now. The meaning is the images you are seeing. But if you just talk about things as facts, it becomes very boring. It it loses all its meaning. Like yeah, we are animals, Homo sapiens sapiens, and we are looking at a mechanical thing with lights and it's like yeah that's true but it's also not true because a lot of things have been inside this mechanical thing and a lot of emotions can be transferred through through this mechanical thing it's not just a mechanical thing and that's it there's a meaning behind it and the way we interact with this is more accurate to describe reality. Here uh, are some examples of how we can alter our own worlds, how, how we can create our own worlds in this digital world, this 3D digital world specifically, because yeah, you know, 3D is more popular than 2D nowadays, even though 2D is beautiful. We can see little yellow creatures called minions with glasses and somehow weird roundy bodies just play around and have big teeth and everything. And we and we don't we don't think about them as unreal. Maybe we do. But when you see a movie, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're minions and they're part of that world. But then on the right, you have like this huge, enormous colossus that you know that if you go outside, you will not find it. But through these experiences, through this, visit, through this uh, idea of visiting a reality which doesn't exist, but at the same time is abstracted and multiplied then you can get this type of experiences. One thing that which always gets me excited is Grand Theft Auto. Because, I mean, I really, really, really love the game. And it, it really strives for that realistic feeling. You know, you're walking down the street and there's a gang and then there's a little dog behind you. There's trash. Everything goes as reality. You know, everything has an order. Everything has a reason why it's here. There are palms because that part of the world, there are palms, the type of buildings, how traffic rules work. But the best thing about this, uh, about this game, about GTA, is how you can break the rules. Because, like, everybody hates rules. But the thing is that we don't hate rules. We just don't like to, we don't want them to disappear. We just don't want to follow them. And the best thing is to break the rules. So when you just go walking down the street and you punch a guy, or you just go down with your car at a million miles per hour and just go going through people, it gives you this feeling of, oh my God, what am I doing? This is, this is like unreal. But you have this freedom inside of this reality. And uh, you can see it in the right gif, which is just absurdly hilarious. Uh, a giraffe um, riding a motorcycle down the streets of LA or Los Santos. And uh, these types of moments 
Uh, if you describe it to somebody who has never played a video game before, like, hey, there's a giraffe and he can drive a motorcycle down LA and, and everything. It's like, what? But it's true. Uh, and it's real in its own reality, uh, which is why is it so fascinating for me and how uh, I'm really in love with this. I'm going to talk about uh, some of my favorite artworks, uh, especially... Yeah, I will call them more artworks. Uh, this is called Everything. Uh, it's created by David O'Reilly, which is a famous animator. And I I love this game because it's it's not a game. Like there's no way to win or to lose. It's an interactive interactive experience. How is it an interactive experience? Literally, you can be everything. You can see there that you can, you can become a human. You can become a horse. You can become a bacteria. You can become a ladybug. You can become a planet. You can become a cell. You can, you can become a galaxy. And when you become one of them, you move with them. And you can create like communities of the things you are in. So if you are... Uh, let's say you are a galaxy, you can find other galaxies. You can have like this harmonious dance with other galaxies. And uh, I don't remember who said it, but some uh, uh, philosophers said it, that reality is a dance. And uh, it's a dance of atoms. It's a dance of particles. And this idea is just like went together so perfect for me because you could just see, and there was there, there, there's just this one moment when you go outside of like the universe, so 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 far away, that you end up being a, at an atom, like you you go so to the outer world, and you end up being in the smallest part of the inner world, and then you go up up again, and then you find out that you are um, an ant, and it's like this game of uh, the inside and the outside is paradox which makes it even more beautiful oh, this for me super liminal uh, this is this is more like a game this is a puzzle game but what I love about uh, this game the concept is the play of perspective and I think the catchphrase of this game is not everything you perceive is real. Or not everything real is perspective. I don't remember. It's something in the... In, but as you can see, it plays with a lot of perspective games. And you can alter your reality by using your perspective. So if you want the sign to be big, you just have to put it in context to the other things around to use it to open the door or in the left you can see that it looks like a very long corridor but when you get to the corridor it's actually just the cube with a texture and we are so used to the patterns of our reality that we get lost and when we see this kind of things that makes something in our brain tick and be like huh yeah it's true not everything is like that I find it quite fascinating. Uh, Nikita is also a great artist. Um, my favorite work of him is Ugly, but he has a lot of just tests and experiments and everything. Uh, right now, there's this... I don't, know, I don't know how to call it, but like maybe let's call it a virus. There's this virus idea. Because ideas are, are viruses in some sense. That when you do an animation, when you're doing something digital, the more real you do it, the more realistic it looks, the better. And I don't agree with that idea because when we try to create something, we try to create it in the most pure way and the most powerful way. When the Greeks did their tragedy in theater, they didn't want to be super real. They didn't act it to be super real. They wanted to, the drama because... For them, the drama was what made people feel emotions, and that's what made the reality of it true. And uh, 
here Nikita does this in a very fascinating way because if you see the, the little gifts, you can see some little artifacts like colorful cubes and circles. And those things are kind of manipulators of a 3D program. And those things are not supposed to be there because you should do the animation and then you should finish it and you should hide them so that nobody sees them because why would people see them? But I love that he he's like, you know what? I'll just, I'll just leave it there. And it becomes this breaking of reality that creates its own version. Like, okay, these characters have this, things but these things are part of their world you know that this is 3d but at the same time they work within the 3d world so the the guy on the right which is like spinning around the vertices of the character just start to break apart and that's not something that's not something that would happen in real life but in the symbolism of the 3d world it can happen and that's how he shows it or in, in the one on the left, the background is just a photo of a real life place. But everything else is just 3D. You can even see the, the ladder, how it bends because it's just a projection. And those little small moments for me are just like so great. And I think we live in a very uh, lucky era because we are able to do this type of things just in our room with our computer it doesn't take now a lot of processing power to create something interesting and to think that in our phones we have i don't know how many times the power that pe that people use to go to the moon for me it's just incredible and even more incredible when instead of going to the moon they use it to create something like this Another artist, which is uh, kind of a love and hate relationship because uh, Beeple, um, his real name is Mike, uh, he's very popular right now. And uh, he does uh, renders, 3D renders in uh, Cinema 4D. He has some things which for me are like, eh, I don't really like this. I don't think this is like true art. He has like Trump uh, holding a bird in front of um, uh, the name of the building in Washington, Parliament, and uh, and then Kim Jong Un in front of Boss Lightyear, and then Baby Yoda eating Jabba the Hutt, and a big circle, and then Clinton breast. No, it's not breastfeeding. Is crotch feeding Trump, and then. Um, a little golden thing on the left, which is more balanced and less uh, explosive. And I don't like that he ha he he sometimes uses this sense of like too much irony and uh, shock value in his works. But I really like the works that really are like beautiful. But that's just my personal preference. But the best thing about this artist, uh, these works in general, is that all of his artists, uh, it's, not, it's not the White House. Um, I, I mean, all of these works, he did it, he does one render every day. All these that you are seeing, he did in one day. And he has done it for the last 10 years not skipping a day every day creating one sunday saturday even when he's sick even when his uh, child was going to be to get born he didn't miss any day every day he did something and maybe you could be like no nah, no nah, nah, that's crazy i mean how can he do this in a day probably he he just makes like a lot and then just publishes it but no, no, he makes it every day. And if you go to his uh, Instagram his Instagram account, which is Beeple underscore crap, you can see every day he'll post something new. And he's done it for the last 10 years. And that's crazy. And that 
made him be the first digital artist to sell his work. He a few months ago, weeks ago, he sold um, he sold his first five thousand six hundred works, if I remember correctly, in sixty nine million dollars. And it, I mean, it's digital. It's not something that you can touch. I mean, you can print it, but you can. You, I mean, if you go to his Instagram, you have it all of them for free. But still. In the auction, it was $69 million. And uh, this is where NFTs come from. And NFTs start. Now, NFT is a whole a whole other subject that will take a lot of time to, to unpack. But uh, the idea of NFT is that basically now, uh, using a unique uh, blockchain, you can now buy and sell digital artwork and now you can see who is the the owner and it's unique and uh nobody can claim that it's not that it's it's from other guy because there is uh proof that is that person and right now everybody is trying to sell them like if you go to rarible.com super rare there's a lot of things that are, are selling for thousands of dollars and people don't know how or what to do or this like giant money bubble which is for some people great for other people it's like disturbing because uh cryptocurrency doesn't have like uh, it's not regulated and so prices are going up and down and up and down and just the last two days uh the prices in ethereum which is the the, the cryptocurrency which is used for selling um art went up like a lot if you had like a, a few dollars there now it's like multiplied by a lot and you can just take it out and make it rubles and just use it in your normal life but this value of money is just so weird and not a lot of people understand it uh but a lot of artists are getting a lot of money with this a lot of artists are not so it's kind of interesting how how this thing moves around. So yeah, um, I think we are getting to the end of uh, of this, and so well, I'd like you to I'd like to invite you to to try to do it yourself. Try to to learn a little bit of three D. Try to 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 do something uh, impossible possible through the digital mm -hmm. and uh yeah and if you are planning to to apply to uh, the, ma the masters of art and science uh well i'm very happy uh if you join us and uh you would have classes with me and uh, we would hopefully talk about a lot of things because there's a lot of to talk about and just and talk about and do because to do is sometimes more important than to talk. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you have any question uh, or anything that you want to talk about more, uh, you can ask questions right now or you can just send me an email or write to me on Instagram. Uh, whatever question. I don't care if it's about 3D, about life or about my favorite Russian cuisine. It's fine. Uh, so if somebody has any questions, you are free to ask. No, nobody. Okay, we have a question with uh, uh, from Marina, which is, do you have your experience with NFT? I do. Uh, I have uh, two NFTs uh, up in Rarible, but um, there's something interesting right now happening, which is uh, 
that people are are not treating the NFT marketplace as um, art marketplace. They're, they're not trying to buy the things that are more beautiful or the things that are like similar to what we would call a real piece of art. Uh, people are are more investing in that sense in things closer to them. So if you make a render with the logo of Bitcoin or if you do something with memes, uh, if you do something uh, about mm, something popular but funny at the same time, that will get more attention than if you, if you create a beautiful painting about, about flowers or uh, a super talented thing. And because right now uh, there's no real art, at, at least that I know of, there's no real real art collectors uh, in the NFT space. So everybody who is buying and who is selling is just in the community of NFTs, which is a very kind of closed community. So they always try to to buy and sell like what they'd like more than anything. So it's kind of weird. Like you can go super know, rareable.com and just see what people are um, are selling there. Like you can see there was a cube, a 3D cube who was spinning around and that sold for about $200,000. And it, I mean, it was just a cube. Uh, you can make it in less than 10 minutes if you know how to animate in Blender or in Maya or in 3D Max, but it sold like for so high price. And there's, and no, there's like, no like um, yeah. meaning behind the cube. Uh, so it's a very weird place right now. Very interesting to watch. And uh, I'm not saying that you should do NFTs or you should not, because it's still like a, a very gray area. But if you have time and if you're interested, you should check it out. If, you, if you're interested and you want to try it, go ahead. Uh, you can also send me a message and, tell, and ask me, hey, how do you do it? Or something like that. I can guide you a little bit. Any other questions? You're welcome. So if there's no other questions, um, then thank you all for coming. And uh, I hope that my lecture was entertaining and uh, informative. Uh, and I didn't take too much of your time. Uh, and I hope to see you again soon. Yes, you can watch uh, my artworks. I, if you go to my Instagram, you can see it there. I am I'm starting to post them a little by little because I'm a little bit doubtful about when something is good or not so i'm getting pushed by people to be like hey post them ah, okay but yeah uh in instagram you can see i think my animations are also in, in instagram it's about uh robots and art and art and consciousness existential stuff ah. my things Ethan, um, I'd like to ask you something. Uh, I was wondering if it was hard for you to learn Russian. I'm from Latin America as well, so I'm just curious about how hard it is to learn this new language. Thanks. Oh, that question. Uh, I've been living in Russia for two years and a half. And... Um, it's very hard, especially if you come from a country that the language is super different. So if you if you speak Slovenian, it's going to be easy. 
fair. Not that doesn't mean it's easy. Um, but for me, Spanish is my native language. So I, I, I mean, I can understand Russian pronunciation, but uh, the language itself is, has a, a lot of different structures. And I can understand more than I can speak. So I basically know the, the basics of uh, Russian language. But if you are afraid of coming here because of the language, don't be. Because people are very kind and uh, they're very friendly. And even if they don't speak English, uh, you could just get along like trying to speak Russian trying to learn you by yourself like if you want to buy milk in a shop just like learn those words by heart and people will be like oh he's, he's trying to learn our language and that's like it makes people feel good because you're trying to integrate to the culture so uh if you don't know anything no russian at all don't be afraid it's it's okay uh you will get lost a few a few times but nothing bad will happen it will be fun you will you will grow a lot and uh you will learn a lot too and I, i'll just go for it i mean i i've been living here and I, my level of russian is not that good and uh, i've managed so i think you can manage too great thank you very much Hey, you can ask more questions or leave them in the chat and I'll read them. Read them. If you arrived here late, probably this uh, stream will be on YouTube. So you can watch them from the beginning there. If you want to know what you would learn 3d modeling courses i could also tell you i don't know just ask whatever you want <laughs> for these 3d courses uh do we need to uh, have certain i don't know basic knowledge about um animation and i mean drawing graphics or something like that no no the courses I designed the course to be uh, made for people who have no idea about like anything at all. I mean, it, it would be faster for you if you know how to sculpt or draw or everything, but uh, the courses are mainly, I mainly designed them to be useful for everybody. Yeah, if you just want to use 3D as a way to show people how your artwork will look in an installation, you can do it for that. If you want to do animation, you can do it for that. If you just want to focus on another stuff, uh, you can do it for that. So I think, well, I, I can't speak about the other courses, but at, at least in my course, uh, it's pretty open. And let's say if you come and you say like, I want to do... Mike Wasowski from Monster Sync in 3D. It's like, okay, let's do Mike Wasowski for, for Monster Sync in 3D. It's like, whatever you need, um, I'm here to help you do it. Doesn't matter how crazy it is. Where can we find those courses? You can find those courses in the Art and Science Master's program. Anastasia says, how do you see the future of digital art? Will every artist become a digital one? Ah, huh, interesting question. Uh, the future of digital art. I believe that not every artist will become digital, but I believe that they need to have a digital platform to promote themselves. Because right now, if you like it or if you don't like it, like I don't like Facebook. <laughs> But I know that I need to have Facebook for certain reasons of communication and everything. And like, imagine if you if you didn't have your phone, you will all your contacts, all your communication will be lost. And it's like living outside of a reality, literally, about this talk. 
And if you just be alone in your artistic bubble and you don't engage in, in the digital realm, then you will lose a lot of people because especially now after COVID, a lot of introverts especially are just like inside the computers and won't have like time or energy to go out or to meet people or everything. So a lot of people are just moving online. A lot of people's lives didn't change when COVID started because they were always home. And now, even right now, we're like talking in Zoom. I don't know how we would be talking if this wouldn't be, if the, if the pandemic didn't happen. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think they will move all to digital, but I think they need a platform to promote their physical artworks in the digital. Daniel asks, can you recommend some platforms to explore digital art, a part social media, Instagram, Twitter? Mm. Apart from digital, uh, apart from the normal social media where you can find digital art, festivals. Uh, well, and that's just sense of animation. If you just look at uh, animation festivals, you can find like weird stuff like you just search in google animation festivals you have a list you can just go one by one and you can find things that you would never think that you could see like it it, it would really uh, disturb you or you will fall in love with it because like if you you go and you see like festival of animation in poland and you're like huh and you see the winner and it's like that's something i've never seen before and, and it's something that you would never see otherwise because it's very local and that's the beauty of it. Now, with all the algorithms of YouTube and social media, it shows you what it thinks you want to see. And sometimes to see what you, to see what you want to see is not the best thing because you don't grow. It's better to, to see what you don't want to see because then you're not in your bubble. So try to search outside of those things and hopefully it, will, it, would, it would be better. I mean, I know that, uh, at least in my experience, it was better to see something weird that moved my mind than something that, oh, yeah, I like that. Or, eh, it's fine. So that's why I, I don't really like uh, Google reading my data. Not because I think my data is important, but because I don't like to be recommended stuff because sometimes I like to watch things like super weird that I know that maybe I like, maybe I don't like. That's just me. I hope that's an answer to your question. Any other questions? You're welcome. <laughs> Come on, you can ask whatever you want. Every question is fine. If not, then I'll end this call. <laughs> it's not a threat. <laughs> Okay, then. And so, again, thank you so much. And um, I hope you, Jainas, or at least you get something out of this lecture, this small lecture. Uh, and hope to see you soon if you come to Russia or not, or on social media, whether, whenever. And yeah, have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.